What's up, sinners? This month's episode of the Manos Collection is a re-upload. It was a video I produced for another channel, and I recently decided to add it to this series because one, it fits in really well with the format, and two, admittedly, it was a lazy way to skip the month. But don't worry, next month we'll return with a all-new, all-produced episode of the Meadows Collection, where I'll be reviewing Batman, Dark Knight, Dark City, a criminally underrated Riddler story. Be, uh, be there for that. So, until then, enjoy the show. Hey, what's up, American Ninja Warriors? This is The Real Manos, and I have come to you today to talk about a uh, classic comic book storyline in Daredevil. This is when Matt Murdock's secret identity got blown in the public eye all over the papers. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm talking about the Brian Michael Bendis run. I'm actually talking about a run 10 years earlier from 1993 called Ball from Grace. Yes, that storyline. It seems to have gotten the reputation as being, oh, that one cheesy story arc where Daredevil got that black costume that nobody likes and is an example of bad 90s comics. Well, there's a little of that, and there's actually more to this storyline than you might suspect, and I'm here to talk about it with you. Uh, first things first, uh, it is a uh, comic written by D.G. Chichester and uh, drawn by Scott McDaniel. Uh, this is from 1993, and it's from issues 319 to 325. And a little backstory on this. Uh, Chichester started out with a bang with this book with a story arc called Fall of the Kingpin. And he's a big fall guy, apparently. He really likes that. He had the... Uh, he had replaced Anne Nuchini, and he felt like the one thing that needed to be done was address Kingpin, and that, that's what he did in his first story arc. And it's actually a really satisfying read. I hope to review it sometime in the future. What I'm talking about today is after a couple of years, sales had started to go down. Keep in mind, this is 1993. This is the dawn and explosion of of extreme comics in terms of art and terms of writing and if your book didn't feature a team of 20 characters that had very generic words as names and torsos that could twist in inhuman ways and they have all gr gritting teeth your book isn't going to sell and the sales have been dropping for Daredevil for some time. It kind of became just another book that is out there. And they were told by higher-ups at uh, Marvel, do something to increase sales. And do something is a vague threat of cancellation, or at least getting fired. So this is their attempt to do something about that. Now, this is about around the time... I'd say this is probably in the middle of uh, story arcs where books were kind of revamping their titles. You know, it really got going with uh, the death of Superman, Nightfall. But most of the main superheroes were going through some sort of story arc like this. A lot of them were being replaced or killed or some big change in their status quo. And they were happening in big epic stories. Like I mentioned, Death of Superman, uh, Nightfall, Wonder Woman had gone through this, uh, as well as Green Lantern, uh, Spider-Man, Iron Man. Everybody 
had their turn at bat at getting destroyed in some uh, huge epic story. Some were better than others, and some were not so great. This one, I thought, really is typical of Daredevil, and how Daredevil goes into the whole revamp epic story arc thing. And what Ch Chester chose to do was just go nuts uh, with with a whole bunch of story uh, lines. And it would result in a new costume, a new status quo, and his secret identity getting blown. So where should I really start? Because this is a huge, huge st story. This It centers around one certain thing, but it has this rotating amount of plots. Uh, let, me, let me go into this. I, I guess you could call plot A... Uh, the storyline dealing with uh, Eddie Passam. He is a psychic who, 20 years earlier, was forced to take part in an illegal experiment uh, performed by General Harry TNT Ken Kenroy. And the general had devised this virus that could physically turn you into what you feel like you are. Uh, in other words... I guess to quote uh, Frankenfurter, don't think it, be it, the virus. And he has been on the run. Uh, the general had been caught and arrested and court-martialed by uh, Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, but he has still been chasing, uh, chasing the psychic uh, because he was a key ingredient to help make this thing. Um, he has joined the snake route. And the Snake Root is a clan, a sub-clan of the, the Hand. And I'm not sure what makes them so different. They all have very specific visual costumes. They're very action thing, figure friendly. And they're trying to get it back. Eddie is on the streets, homeless, in New York City. And unfortunately, his, his feelings, his distraught pain is is um, reverberating and kind of transmitting to other people. So it's driving other homeless people crazy into acts of violence uh, on themselves or on others. So that's when Daredevil starts to investigate and he finds Eddie. But that's not the only story going on around here. Meanwhile, Hellspawn... Uh, Hellspawn is a doppelganger from a previous crossover that was still hanging around. I believe it was one of the Infinity crossovers. I can't remember which one, the second or third one. Anyway, he is still trying to kill and replace uh, Daredevil. Uh, also, there is a reporter uh, named uh, Sarah Harrington, and she was working with Bill... Uh, <laughs> she, not Bill. Uh, ben Urick. And... Uh, Ben is kind of caught in this crossfire because uh, the Bugle is going through this power struggle. J. Jonah Jameson is struggling to keep ownership of the Bugle uh, with this other rich, powerful guy. And he is trying to manipulate uh, the Union against Jonah and because Jonah probably isn't the best person to work for, let's face it. So he has all his reporters you know, make sure their files... Their computer files are safe, and Ben really doesn't know what he's doing with that, so he asks uh, Sarah Harrington to check into his files. Well, while she's doing that, she finds the story he wrote about Matt Murdock being Daredevil. So she hacks it and keeps it and sells it to a competing newspaper. This is all the while going on. Oh, and one more thing. The Snake Root is working with the General because they want this virus that I mentioned in order to build their own Electra. So what they've done is they've figured, why train somebody new? We really like Electra, and we want her to be part of our, our clan. So essentially, they have found this body that uh, matches up to Electra. They have captured Garrick. You remember the cyborg from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Well, he was in a... Electra miniseries, Electra Assassin. So he has vivid memories of her and violent 
destructive memories of her. So, hey, that's good. We'll use that and mix it with this virus, and boom, we'll have a new Electra. Uh, this, of course, doesn't sit well with Electra, who finds out about this news, and comes down from the mountain that she was hanging out with, uh, with the chaste, in order to stop it. Whew! Okay, I think that's everything. That is going on in... It's a five-part story, but there's a prologue, so it's a six-part story. And all that's going on in a very action-packed storyline as well. Uh, somehow also Mobius and Venom and Silver Sable all kind of find their ways into the story. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, the, uh, the writing on this book, it's like I mentioned, it's a very action pa pace. Uh, it barely slows down at any point. Uh, it starts off with flashbacks building the, the backstory of, of this uh, storyline and jumps right into action over and over again. And that's kind of the motif for each issue, uh, which sometimes is fun and exciting and occasionally is jarring. Um, I mentioned the costume. Daredevil's costume, his black and red costume in this, comes from the fact that he feels like uh, this is getting really intense and serious, and he needs a little bit better armor. So what he does is he breaks into a few factories, on uh, steals the material, and by the way, pays them online. Uh, pays them online uh, under anonymous uh, uh, names and, and accounts and such like that. Uh, so that's why he has this uh, super cool new costume with the armor. And I'll tell you this, I know this costume has a bad reputation, but here's the thing. When drawn by Scott McDaniel, it looks pretty good, even with those weird kind of shoulder things. Uh, I haven't seen anybody else draw the costume and it look good. Uh, it's one of it's much like Joe Quesada's uh, Nightfall Batman armor. When he draws it, looks awesome. When anybody else, looks like a big clunky pile of crap. And same thing here. Um, I maybe it's just it. It's one of those things where the suit fits his art style. And speaking of art style, let me get into that a little bit because not only Chester turned out all the stops. That also prompted Scott McDaniel to do something. Um, and what he did was he developed an art style for this. Now, if you go and look at issue 319, which is the first, uh, which is the prologue to this, and maybe previous issues, like a few issues beforehand, you'll notice he has a kind of like standard comic book style. And what you get to watch, which I think is the interesting thing, as this uh, story unfolds, is you see Scott's style develop into the style we more know that he later on used in uh, DC's Nightwing and Batman comics. And I, I've heard him talk about this, and I, I, I get the feeling that he thought, okay, this is Daredevil, and it's a few years after Frank Miller. What would Frank Miller and his Sin City style look like? On Daredevil and that's what he went for and to be honest it's a really interesting choice at times cuts a little bit too close to looking like it's uh, ripping off uh, particularly in issue 322 chapter 3 where he has a big splash page and it's in black and white and it's very on the nose of what you're doing um, I think that's probably the the one moment he goes a little too far with it, frankly. But it's really exciting to actually see an artist find himself in one story arc. And his style has not changed since then, by the way. Um, he's perfected it, and in, on uh, Nightwing it looked a little better. Uh, ish, the last issue, issue 325, looks a lot like the uh, Scott McDaniel uh, most of us are aware of. Now, there are some issues with this. And I'll get into that. Obviously, probably the elephant in the room is the fact that this is done in an extreme style. Albeit, Daredevil extreme style is still more thoughtful and mature than, say, an issue of Brigade. But it is still there. One of the things I have an issue with when I read Chichester's work on uh, not only this storyline but other storylines is he tends to overwrite, and he does it really badly sometimes 
there is so much unnecessary clunky dialogue in some scenes uh, where it could be cut. He really abuses writer narration a lot. Uh, there are times during this story where he talks about, as a writer narrative, explaining scenes that I am clearly looking at, and sometimes in a couple of instances are going on in the dialogue. Like, it, you could actually, there are certain scenes in this, you could completely just negate and don't pay attention to any of the uh, narration, and you'll be fine. And then there are other times we have to read it to kind of know what is going on. Uh, so you kind of have, I mean, on a second read, you can, you'll can you know what to skip. But after, but the first time, you probably have to just drudge through a lot of it. There is the uh, instance, see, what's going on with the, um, the outing of uh, Daredevil's secret identity is actually going on in the background because he's paying more attention to uh, saving Eddie Passam, stopping the virus, saving himself from Hellspawn, and dealing with Elektra. So that's actually kind of a, a minor subplot, but it carries over all the way to the end. Another issue I probably should bring up is, and this is very blatant, it's one of the things they wanted to do to save the book. And apparently it worked, but it's still not great for reading is the fact that uh, they have some guest stars in this, namely Venom. And Venom is probably the most annoying of the guest stars because a, Mobius is in here, and you think, Mobius, that's a big name. The, at the time, Marvel was pushing Mobius. And Silver Sable was in here, uh, also at the time, uh, a character that Marvel was, uh, you know, trying to, you know, give some light. But obviously, Venom was the the big star, and Venom has the least to do with this story. Essentially, he finds out that uh, the Snake Root is in town, and he decides to go and meddle with this whole case just to prove himself better than Spider Man, and he gets into a fight with Daredevil, and Daredevil does something interesting. He talks him out of fighting. He uh, he pulls the Matt Murdock lawyer style of uh, crime fighting. He he reasons with him and talks him out out of what he wants to do. He convinces him. Uh, <laughs> it's actually hilarious. They're they're still while fighting, and he's talking to him the whole time. By the way, uh, the art style on this is really beautiful during the uh, the venom pages it is granted this fight is a huge waste of page space there are pages and pages and pages dedicated to it and it doesn't affect the story at all uh, but it is beautiful scott mcdaniel does this uh neat thing where he connects the panels by webbing and changes the coloring uh of the the backgrounds uh specifically for this sequence yeah, so, yeah, it's a pointless detour that is kind of blatant. And you read it and you go, oh, okay, yeah, I know this is about selling a few extra books. Uh, but at least it's well, well done. Also, speaking of well done, the cover for this issue, which is 323, is spectacular. It's probably one of the best covers featuring Venom I've ever seen in my life. It is gorgeous. Uh, with Matt Murdock, not... Daredevil, Matt Murdock being consumed by the Venom symbiote. It's, it doesn't happen in the issue, but good lord, it's gorgeous to look at. And speaking of covers, there is the cover to issue 321, and it is in black and white and red, and it is glow-in-the-dark. Remember, this is the 90s, we have to have specialty covers, and this, for some reason, this chapter... And I think it's because this is the issue where he gets the new costume. So uh, they want to show it off. Therefore, they got the, uh, the glow-in-the-dark cover. And, you know, it's interesting. I hadn't When I put, pulled some of these comics out, I hadn't touched them in years. So I was curious if the glow-in-the-dark effect still worked. All right. Now we're going to take a look and see if this 23-year-old uh, comic... I can't believe that, 23-year-olds. I feel like I just bought this thing. Uh, we're going to see if this 
a glow in the dark effect still works. Now we're just going to hold it up to the light. Now I've already pre-held it up to the light just a few moments ago before shooting. Just to make sure. And here we go. We're going to give it another shot. And there we are. You ready? One, two, three. Well, there you have it. That's Fall from Grace. A not perfect time capsule story arc from the 1990s. And one of the things that I think is probably most important about this book is the status quo change on Elektra. This brought Elektra back into the Marvel Universe for good. And I'm not saying for a couple of years, for good. She's been in the Marvel Universe since this storyline. Now, for those of you who might uh, be wondering, Elektra was killed off famously during the original Frank Miller run, and he brought her back in the last issue of his first run on the book. Pressured to bring her back for years by Marvel and fans, he did one more original hardcover graphic novel called Elektra Lives Again, which he kills her for good forever, no more. And that was his attempt to just finish the argument. There is no more. What he didn't suspect is Marvel would just choose to ignore that and leave it out of uh, continuity. And that's what they did for this. This storyline it completely ignores Electro Lives Again and just is a direct sequel to the last time she was in uh, Daredevil. Uh, which is fine with me. I'm, I'm not a fan of bringing characters back when, when they don't need to be. Uh, but the way this was done I thought was fine. And Electro has actually grown as a character in the Marvel books since then. So I'm okay. The uh, costume itself only lasted a couple more years. Uh, it was, I'd say, maybe in the mid-90s. It had already gotten old-looking and dated. That's when uh, the costume was changed uh, not too long after Chichester left. Chichester stayed for uh, two more story arcs, uh, neither of which were very good. Scott McDaniel stayed for one more story arc afterwards uh, and then took off for DC. Uh, so... Unfortunately, the, the big change uh, outside of Elektra, it was supposed to be Matt Murdock faking his death and taking on a new secret identity, uh, completely abandoning Foggy and Karen, by the way, which is an amazing jerk move, but he did. That only lasted a while, and how it's uh, taken care of and resolved when he comes back is hilarious, and... It makes kind of this whole kind of it makes a two year journey kind of pointless and meandering. Um, so yeah, that's fall from grace in a nutshell. It's uh, pro problematic here and there uh, from a storytelling perspective, but I gotta admit, I love this book. And personally, for me, this is the comic that got me back into Daredevil. I was a big Daredevil fan when I was a kid during Frank Miller's run. Um, when I stopped reading comics in the mid 80s, I slowly came back in the late 80s and I still hadn't picked up Daredevil until I saw the cover for 319, that beautiful, simple shot of him falling off the uh, Empire State Building. And I was just captivated and I had to pick it up and I was suckered ever since. Um, there have been a few bad stories here and there uh, in between now and then, but I've pretty much been hooked on daredevil since i have i don't think i've missed an issue and uh, i gotta owe it to the story for that so out of a rating of five ram chips i'd probably give this one a four uh i do recommend it if you uh, can find it it's a really interesting piece um i do think it is i don't know if it's still in print it may be out of print at the moment i know there was a hard I know there's a hardcover and a trade paperback made of this, and you can also probably find the individual issues pretty cheaply. If you find the individual issues, uh, you got a cool, fun surprise, or maybe, uh, the uh, issue 321 is black, and, is black, white, and red, and a uh, glow-in-the-dark cover, like I mentioned. And the final issue, 325, had a big poster in it, and I actually still have the poster, and I have not removed it. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to put it anyway, so I might as well just leave it in the comic. But it's a huge, gorgeous 
poster uh, drawn by uh, Scott McDaniel. They're really, really pushing his new style of art in this one. Uh, so there it is. Uh, if you've read the book, uh, let me know how you feel in the comments. Or if you've been curious about it, I, I do recommend checking it out. It, it, it's an interesting read and also a visual read. Anyway, that's it for now, so push the button, Lindsay.